welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast. I'm your host, DK, and with me today, as always, is my lovely co-host, la 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 laser Low. Oh, man. The last time I made the horn sounds, the do 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 but... Pew, 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 pew. Yeah, exactly. That's that's where my brain went. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta yeah. do the pew, pew, pew. Anyway, welcome back to the Mixing Music Podcast for real. Thank you for joining, Lou. We're both a little bit low on sleep for various reasons. Seems like you've been staying up late working, uh, building a studio again. Uh, yeah. So literally this Friday marks the last day of uh, like the studio I'm doing for Too Short and stuff. But um, right now I'm kind of like uh, I'm doing this uh, guy, Danny Scheiman. He does like a lot of local recording in like Studio City kind of area. But we're doing like a whole treatment of his live room. So it's it's just been like a lot of panels, a lot of like we're doing custom stains on the outer side stuff. So I'm like, dude, like there's so many little things that you have to do to get these panels done that it just takes a long time. I'm like, you know what? I just kind of want to make some headway on this project so we can knock it out. Amazing. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, dude, uh, do you have, uh, Are you? is it just this Danny project is new, so you're finishing up two shorts. How long is this Danny project going to take? Is this going to be like another... I'm trying Couple to be done months. before the end of this week. Oh, okay. So it's a short one. It's a short one. It's just, uh, there's like 26, 27 panels of various different types, like some clouds, some doors. Um, we're doing uh, wood trimmed gobos and standard two by fours, some that are eight inch deep, some that are four inch deep. Nice. Um, all the fabric was specifically chosen and ordered from a specific company in a specific color code, you know. Nice. Are you, um, do you find yourself kind of pivoting? Because before with the two short stuff and other studio stuff, you've been like full, full studio, part of the studio design and construction team with, mm. I mean, with this guy, it sounds like you're just basically doing the John Hunter thing. Like you're just building panels and kind uh, of doing basic stuff. Yeah. He was referred to me by a mutual friend of ours, uh, Bob Horn. Okay. Um, so it's just one of those where I'm really just helping somebody out on this one. Um, I do have another project that I have meetings with right now for, um, without naming names, it's like for one of the Lakers, we're going to be building a studio. Oh, you mentioned house. that previously. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I know he's a pretty private dude, so I just won't mention the name, but um, yeah, like there, there's already been like meetings um, in person and everything like, uh, you know, sightseeing and all. Um but yeah, there's there's another one in the works uh, right after this short one. Yeah, so um, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad that realistically. That's... Do you yeah. think? Do you find that you'll? Uh, do you think you may pivot more into the John Hunter kind of? By the way, look up. Um, maybe we don't want to do any free promo, but there's a dude out here yeah. in L.A. That all yeah, he, he got does, pretty popular making some pretty standard panels. Yeah, all he does is makes. Yeah, that's what they are. Pretty standard panels. Yeah. But he makes a shit ton, and he goes to people's houses directly and installs them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's like, uh, it's not that expensive. <laughs> it's just For, in the uh, world of I like custom that... acoustic design, it's definitely not expensive. It's like yeah. it's a like GIK acoustics plus a little bit for the install. That's kind of how much it costs. Yeah. Uh, I know the install fee with them is separate, so I'm not sure what that is. But, you know, if they're doing it everywhere, I'm sure it's reasonable. Um, but I think that's kind of like the big thing for them. Like they popped off because that's all they do. It's kind of like the the burger shakes and fries uh, model. You know, you you only have a few products and you do really well at them. Yeah. And they're very accessible. They're very uh, like they're they're priced affordably. So everybody can go to you for that. And I remember when John, Hust uh, John Hunter Acoustics started like a few years ago um, and they started getting into like certain people's studios, but they weren't really everywhere like they are now. Now, they, now they're like a full production thing. So I don't think I see myself pivoting in that direction. But um, what's, uh, what's your friend, friend the TikToker, uh, Shane, right? Yeah, Shane Lance, yep. Yeah, I think he said it great in one of his uh, reels recently where um, the majority of people that work in our industry uh, outside of like the top 2% tend to also have some other businesses that they do that kind of bring an income, whether it be directly monthly or just, you know, at some point. Um, 
when I first started out, I was doing live sound and everything. I was also helping people uh, install consoles and things like that. Like uh, you already know that I did like Chris Brown's house and Trey songs and everybody. So like when you had to do your Trey song session, I knew what was wrong with the console because I was familiar with the actual studio itself. Cause and I'm with, the one with, that installed with that it. specific room, you didn't necessarily do the acoustics. You were part of like the studio setup, like equipment. Exactly. Installing I was responsible and- for software, computers, uh, consoles, uh, monitoring, things of that nature. But the the aesthetic of that studio was not my design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we've uh, had many so, conversations privately about that. Yeah. The um, So that's interesting. So I didn't mean to work. This is just a tangent we were going to talk about mixing drums but this is uh i still want to ask some questions about this like yeah go ahead so you with your studio design stuff which has always been separate from what we've done together like we've had yeah. a st- we've had a recording studio together we've done mixing mastering together we've um and uh, i think i've like helped you make a few <laughs> yeah the podcast i've I, yeah. i've helped you make a few panels but that's like that's not a business that was just a few panels you know like yeah um yeah. and um so with this stuff, it sounds like previously you were more of the guy that would install the electronics, the equipment, put in mm-hmm. the studio equipment, or recommend the studio equipment, use their budget within their budgets that they'd provide, build it out in that sense. Yeah. But now you're kind of going into acoustic design and doing more than just the electronics. And So I'll do um, design consultation on a basic level. What I've done is like I'll subcontract other acousticians if I need something very, very detailed done. Um, for instance, like if they want to see metrics and uh, then I will hire out for that, but I will actually recommend who they should be hiring. So I'm more of a project manager and kind of middleman for those that don't always know what they're looking for exactly. So you, some so people you're just like, want some basic acoustics done. They're like, I just want to kill the echo in the room. I don't really care about fine tuning and helm holds and all that. Um, and that's okay. I think that there's a, there's a time and place for every specific need. Uh, for instance, me and you have met artists who can't hear limiters even when they're hitting minus 20 reduction. No, the, the so, craziest thing yeah. was when we switched speakers and, and then he that, and he couldn't tell when we switched the speakers. I was like, and they were fuck. wildly different speakers. <laughs> yeah, you know? I was like, that's that is insane. Like, <laughs> yeah. so like my goal uh, anytime I'm helping any of my clients is not necessarily to be the smartest guy in the room. That's never necessarily the goal. Nor should that ever really be the goal for anybody. Because if you're the smartest guy in the room, then go to a different room and learn something. You know, there's room for growth for everybody. But. um Honestly speaking, like sometimes people just need a little extra help and where I can place myself, I'll put myself. So for instance, I'll never tell anybody that I'm a a general contractor because I'm not a licensed general contractor. That's not what I am, but I can help you manage your project. Exactly. I can actually help you manage your budget and actually figure out what it is you need exactly and what kind of end results you should be expecting because most people will not look into acoustics or studio design like why get a burrow why get an apollo why get this and that some people just want to track vocals at home make a demo and somebody told them they should buy a c800g for that and it's like dude you don't need a c800g like let me know what your budget is and we can figure out what's most important in your space first and then we can go with there and as you can imagine acoustics is usually the first thing i recommend yeah yeah the um Talking about C800Gs, I'm supposed to, I'm going to try to make a video sometime soon. I probably won't, but I, I really should make a video about this warm audio c I like the clone. honesty thrown in there. I probably won't. Yeah, dude. It's it's getting to this point where like um, the last year I was starting to see hints of it, but this year it's like, I'm just so, so, I mean, getting so damn busy that like I could barely, I can, I can keep doing this podcast, but that's about my threshold right now. Um, yeah. And uh, with the warm audio C eight hundred G clone and the C eight uh, the C eighty that they mm. uh, that they left us with released um, yeah. yeah dude they uh, I want to test those out and hear them and compare the two I, I'm very interested also the fact that the C eighty is not like a large diaphragm condenser it's like a mid it's diaphragm. almost like a mid di- yeah yeah so it's like I mean you know how it is like with different size diaphragms there's like different resonant tones or whatever or like mm-hmm. resonant frequencies that the diaphragm itself resonates at or like something the like that. Eden uh, I th- it was either the Eden or the Oceanus uh, from Latin Audio had the oversized capsule and that helped like reduce sibilance in the recording yeah or yeah. Um, there's something like uh, yeah, the reason why small diaphragm condensers may be better, there was like a video that I used, I watched, it's like small diaphragm condensers may be better for bass instruments, low-end 
like uh, upright bass, for example. Mm-hmm. I think that was the example he's in the video is uh is because something about like the resonant frequency of the capsule itself stays out of the way. So it's like it's out of the way of the bass. It's either below the bass oh. or it's like above the bass or something like that. And so I'm it's better lie. than large diagram seen, diaphragm or whatever. I have seen somebody throw a KM one eighty four on upright before, and I thought that was a little odd, but that that would explain that. Yeah, that the yeah. one eighty is that the tube? The tube? No, one? the one eighty four is the new solid state one, the the modern edition. What is the which one's the tube? By the way, these are KM um, eighty four. Uh, KM Neumann pencil eighty four, not one eighty four. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. That's cool. Um, yeah, Neumann pencil condensers, famous. Yeah, so we're gonna. I'm gonna do some tests. Maybe I'll throw up like the Telefunken M60 since I fuck around, you know, have it. Um, I finally cleaned up uh, the uh, M80, the Telefunken M80 that I have too. Since it was like really weird feeling, it was like sticky. Um, mm. Did you olive oil it like the JBLs? <laughs> no, I did. I did uh, some goo gong. I, I like put put. <laughs> yeah, I took the. <laughs> wait, wait, what? Yeah. Oh my god, you don't know. <laughs> no, mine were pre-oiled. The JBLs yeah. that I had, so I gotta. So uh, there was a time where LSR forty three twenty eight. Um, the, literally the, the same ones that I had before the ATCs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, some people would look at the finish on them after a while and be like, oh, it's a little gunky or sticky or something. You know, something just happened to the finish over time. And I, I feel like it happened to everybody. Um, and if it didn't happen to you, you kind of got lucky kind of situation because it like most people bought them pretty early in their design. Um, but there was a group of people online talking about how they were going to, you know, olive oil the finish because it gave it that shiny smooth look and it took the stickiness away and some people actually went out and did it and i would see like facebook like audio file groups and stuff like that talking about how they did the olive oil trick and they would show before and after photos so people were putting olive oil on their speakers and it was the wildest thing to see i I could never understand why i don't think mine were oiled i think mine were uh sanded so like yeah. that that gunky that rubbery outer layer that like caught all the dust was like taken off of mine. So they were like more shiny. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah, that's that's so I remember that being a thing. I was like at the tail end of that. They were already out of when I bought mine, they were already not producing them mm-hmm. and stuff. Uh but yeah, dude, let's uh let's get into the topic for today's episode. Oh yeah. Sorry, a little bit of tangent, long, long unrelated conversation at the beginning for y'all, I'm sure. This is a podcast. Like no. y'all are in it for the long haul, so thanks for listening. Yeah, but the uh, the episode today is about mixing drums. Um, if you couldn't tell, if you're watching the video, um, I have some tube traps behind me, and I have some tube traps in front of me, which means I've been watching Eric Valentine videos. That's what it means. And <laughs> and Lou and I have the same exact um, speakers, the Strauss NF threes. Mm-hmm. Um, which so many people have been like, dude, are those the Eric Valentine speakers? And I'm like, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about because I'm fucking late to the game. And I got uh, Strauss because Jesse watches Eric Valentine <laughs> and he was the one that recommended me. I trust Jesse. And uh, I'm super late See, to the referrals game. Referrals are really important. Eric Valentine is, uh, I went to listen to some of his work as I always recommended you do. Like, um, listen to the work of the person that you, you, are learning from make sure that you actually like their stuff and dude his stuff is cool he has a drum mixing video where he talks about how he produced a song with uh, greg wells and he was mixing the drums or something like that and um yeah this video so he goes through an entire mix of the drums and uh that's something that i want to spend some time talking about and he's he's also mentioned how he makes his drums um this is really important i feel like for any sort of rock music for any sort of, even within the pop or country, folky stuff, mm-hmm. um, even within hip hop, sometimes you're going to get real drums. And if you don't get real drums, that's like one of the things that I would recommend actually practicing on. Like, uh, if even better, if you have the, there's no better way to learn how to mix drums than to start off with learning how to record drums too. Yeah. Honestly, it was kind of funny. Um, I, 
you know the artist that I work with, uh, James Barr? I work with him and Jonah on like some shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was talking to one of the engineers at a venue because um, we had two show dates uh, this past week. We we were doing a show with K Flay. And um, one of the engineer team members was like, oh, yeah, you know, like I actually take the recordings from the shows home and I practice on those. And I'm like, really? He's like, yeah, because everybody I work with only uses like electronic drums or 808s or things of that nature. So it's like the one time I actually have like live drums to practice on. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's the uh, it's interesting. We both come in a position where we both have well. In the modern LA industry, is slightly rare to have. I, I, I hope that it's not rare to have in general, but in the modern LA industry, among people our age, it's rare to have some actual drum tracking and drum mixing experience. Yeah. Um, and we we have we both have that, which is fun, dude. I love <laughs> Yeah, dude, it's fun. Um, <laughs> you use tools that are different from mine, so I want to talk about how you use like the Sound Radix thing or whatever, the auto. Oh, Sound Radix, yeah. What is it, the auto phase? Uh, I use Auto Align and Pi, uh, two of my favorite. Auto Align. Like, they just I came out with Auto Align see... 2, right? Uh, no, that one's been around for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But uh, I like their marketing because it still looks like it just came out. Um, but, um, yeah, I don't align and, uh, <laughs> their marketing's so good. It makes me yawn, you know? Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> no, uh, but honestly speaking, like they're, uh, they also have a uh, drum leveler, which is kind of like, if you want consistency in your attack and gating, if you will, and it's not even gating, it's like upward compression where you're actually adding dynamics and subtracting dynamics all in one plugin. Uh, so upward and downward compression all in one, uh, which kind of helps if you're using like samples and stuff and you want consistency in your hits. Um, but they got a bunch of tools over at Sound Radix that I definitely like. But um, yeah, if we were to jump into one of them, I would say Auto Align is probably my favorite one because it's the, it's the most messed up part in most drum recordings I get, uh, which is time alignment of the microphones. Interesting, yeah. You know, it's it it's it's very very easy to hear the difference once everything is aligned and in sync and in phase, and that's where Pi comes along. So Auto Align will basically listen to the initial source and whatever you deem to be the primary source you're listening to. Um, what I've done is I'll use like a mono overhead, and then that mono overhead I don't really filter anything out of it just yet. I wanted to hear the kick drum. I wanted to hear the snares, the toms, things like that, and I'll actually sync up to the overhead um reason being is that if everything were to come down on the one but um you know one mic is only two inches uh from the skin right like let's say the top snare mic versus the overhead which is probably like three feet up four feet up whatever we're talking about a three to four millisecond de uh, delay between the source be getting from one to the other um, I don't know how time and sound works, but uh, short. Speed of Three sound, I think, seconds. is like 1,100 feet per second, I think it is. So it's roughly like 1.1 milliseconds per millis. Uh, yeah, 1.1 feet per millisecond, I think it is. Something of that nature. Yeah, 343 meters per second. Yeah, and a meter being three feet. 3.3 uh, yeah. feet, right? It's about, yeah. yeah. Just just say three. Yeah, but we'll say like 1,000 feet per per second right if we want to just round it down um so a thousand feet per second that means for every millisecond you're getting one foot you know so yeah. if you think about it a three to four foot distance between the snare top mic and the overhead that's a three to four millisecond blurring of the sound so once you actually align them which auto align will listen to whatever you said as the primary source information the one that it's going to use as the reference and you say okay now align the snare top mic to it it's going to listen to the snare top mic and delay it in time so that it perfectly aligns with the overhead mic yeah and you do that for the rest of the drum set and suddenly you start hearing your snare pop even harder. You start hearing your kick even harder. And once you've got all your timing aligned, what uh, the second thing I use from Sound Radix is Pi, which is kind of a momentary phase alignment tool. Uh, reason being is that, you know. Are you sure it's Sound things... Radix? Oh, wait, no. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah, yeah. Pi. What is, what is, what is that? Uh, it's kind of like a momentary phase tool, if that makes sense. Like it doesn't permanently shift the phase and it doesn't always shift the phase in the same degree. Um, so what it does is it listens dynamic, to the actual. It says, it says, the website says dynamic phase rotation. 
Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but uh, yeah, so it'll basically just say, okay, you know what? Um, in group one, because you can set groups and you can have them reference the whole mix of uh, all the tracks that are in the Pi uh, tool, because you can use instances and they will recognize all the instances. And you can either put them into little groups or into many groups and have it reference the the all the groups or a specific group. You can also have it focus on low end frequency specifically or just the broad range, 20 to 20K, and try to get as in phase as possible across the spectrum. So let's say you're doing kick drum and bass, or no, you wouldn't do bass. Uh, pi, fun fact for everybody and just fair warning, it doesn't really work well with like sustained information. It does very well with transient information. Uh, sustained information, sometimes you'll hear like warbling if you go too far. Um, but you could do it like kick snare, your toms and everything and against your overheads. And then it'll actually bring those a little more in phase than a standard 180 flip. So if you think about like the little labs, IBP, which is a manual phase rotation tool, um, this one just takes the manual factor into automatic, you know, so it'll detect the phase, it'll reference it in that moment and it'll flip the phase according to what it believes to be the most in phase positioning. Yeah, so we, we went on in, into a tangent directly into the tools without talking about any sort of uh, referencing anything that uh, about it. But we're, the reason why we're talking about this is because the most important thing with, with drums is correcting phase. Now, yeah. phase is typically not an issue. Um, the only time that phase becomes an issue and the only time that using linear phase EQ becomes valid is things when you have multiple mics on a single source. Snare so, top mic, snare bottom mic, kick in, kick out. Yes. Yeah. And you know how the waveform, this is this is not for you, Lou, but this is for the listener. You know mm -hmm. how the waveform goes up and down, right? You you can see it if you zoom in on the DAW, you can see it go up and down or down and up or whatever. Um, if you think about it like this, if you have a mic on the bottom of the snare and the top of the snare, at the same time you hit and you compress the top skin, it's going to inflate and expand the bottom skin. So you're going to have the exact opposite phase for the snare mic top and the snare bottom mic, which is why you want to flip the phase of the snare bottom mic. You know, things like that. And when things are out of phase, it is very obvious. I'm sure that when you use auto align and pi, you're mm -hmm. going to get a significant amount of punch. Like it sounds like it's already been e EQ'd. It sounds way punchier. The transients hit way better. There's way more low end information. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, things blend way better. You, uh, Lou, you use auto align and pi and maybe a few other tools. I do yep. everything manually by ear, which is slower and potentially not as good or better. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, and, but I do it by ear. I do it the old school way. Um, with some little labs or just just flipping the phase. There's also like mm -hmm. Waves has this in phase plugin, which is not half as good, but um, you could do it a little bit. You can do some things there. And uh, but the point is, the number one most important thing about mixing real drums recorded in a real room with multiple mics is to get everything in phase. Now, some of this is also timing. Now, you could go as far as now. This kind of ruins the point of overheads and room mics because you want. It's about that like that tail, that decay afterwards. Yeah. But you can even go as far as to zoom in on the waveforms and line up the overheads to be the exact same um, initial transient, uh, start on the exact same initial transient as the snare and the kick. So like yeah. line them up exactly with the close mics. Um, again, with overheads, there's supposed to be this like slight micro delay which makes it like, you know, kind of gives it some space. Um, mm -hmm. so it doesn't like, it doesn't take, it doesn't ruin the point of it, but it, um, but that is something that you have to consider, like try it, you know, line it up directly with the close mics. Um, yeah. it may make it better, may not. Same thing with the room mics, room mics more so because they're even more distant. Um, you can line it up with the close mics and make it exactly in phase. This is literally moving the waveform. So we're not talking about yeah. flipping the phase. We're talking about moving the audio clips in, in such small increments that you line up the initial transient phases. You can almost look at a room mic as like naturally being your pre-delay on your room verb. Like if you space it 20 feet back, then, you know, as we mentioned earlier, that's probably a 20 millisecond difference. So that little bit of pre-delay of the source actually getting to the mic might actually be what you're going to mix in later with your reverb plugin. Might as well work with the room in its current position. 
Yeah. So, um, and then sometimes even more so, like if you have room mics pointing at the wall behind you rather than directly at the drum kit. I was literally at East West last night for, you were talking about Shane. Shane Mm -hmm. and uh, Greasy had um, a little live podcast thing going on last night. So we went to East West and they were um, supposed to show drum tracking in Studio A out there, but um, in Frank Sinatra's room, that's what Greasy kept calling it. But um, yeah, the, he had the mic set up so the the mics were in that little corner drum room. Mm-hmm. Mics were pointed at the wall, not at the the drums. So I never mm-hmm. got to. I never. I I left a little early, so I didn't get to stick around for the drum tracking bit. But yeah, I mean that's a, that's another technique as well. But anyway, um, drums lining things up, getting things in phase. Now the reason why I bring up this episode and the reason why I, I was talking about Eric Valentine is because he had. Um, a bunch of cool tactics and techniques that I thought were interesting. A couple things that I didn't know. A couple things that I didn't realize were normal um, that I want to talk about. I, like I felt like I'm a genius when it comes to mixing drum. Turns out that everybody Eric Valentine's been doing it, and I'm like, God damn it, I'm not special. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> <laughs> um, but the first thing is interesting. So once you've already the first thing before you do anything. Um, even borderline before you do like proper taking the time for like nuance level leveling and like uh, moving faders around, mm-hmm. phase, phase and timing, get that out of the way. Once everything's in phase, then you can start messing with levels. And there's different techniques and different ideas. I've heard people um, say using the overheads only for the symbols or use the overheads for everything and and only use the close mics as supplemental. So even use the kick drum in the low end of the overheads. So there's there's been many different ideas and that comes with different sounds and this would be something that you experiment with. Um, I typically uh, like to use overheads for the entire kit and supplement with the real drums. Um, but he even did things like duplicating the snare and hyper compressing the duplication or distorting the duplication and only using the top end. He used a lot of Saturn one of the things that I didn't, he, he explained to me uh, in the video, in the drum mixing video, is that he uses Saturn and he does three different filter, uh, three different, because um, you can switch up the frequency bands or something like that. Or you can add bands. Instead of doing broadband saturation on the entire track, you can say like different saturation for each band. You can split it up, right, Lou? Yeah. For Saturn. And he said, yeah. he said when, when you use different bands and you create new filters, it'll be weird with the phase at those filter points. So, if, for example, if you, do, if you duplicate a kick drum, so it's literally the same exact track, and you put Saturn on one, you have to put the same exact Saturn on the other with the same exact filter on it, or else it's going to get really weird and phasey. Yeah. Um, which was interesting. I didn't, I've never yeah. understood that, but the way he explained Within- it... The within the plugin itself, you also have like linear phase, natural phase, or uh, minimal phase. I think it's the other option. Um, he didn't talk about and, that, so I didn't even know that was an option. I've never even used Saturn on drums, so I don't use Saturn almost oh, ever. Oh, dude, yeah. You, I don't know if you remember, but during my mixing, uh, mixing masterclass, uh, no, you're a big that Saturn guy in the mix. Yeah, almost everything was uh, saturation through Saturn. And that was the one comment that I got back from uh, audience listeners, which is like, dude, it's almost no EQ use at this point. Yeah, and that's kind of where, that's not actually a bad thing. Um, Yeah, it's just taste difference. And again, you're like EQing, but with Saturn, with distortion. Yeah, yeah. Um, So what was interesting as well, I mean, another taste thing that was interesting is that he showed his before and after drum sound. Go watch the Eric Valentine drum mixing video, the entire thing. It's like proper 45, 50 minutes long. It's worth every second. Um, But he did, uh, what was interesting is that the drums, I think for this particular song, he's a rock dude through and through. Mm -hmm. Um, So I thought it was interesting that he, uh, he compressed the entire drum kick the drum kit in a way that you can hear the compression in the cymbals. So the cymbals would like every kick hit would be, would like, (laughs) like it'd like quiet down and like swell every single kick hit. Mm -hmm. I couldn't quite do that with my mouth, but you know what I'm talking about where it's like, (laughs) you can hear the compression (laughs) with the kick kit. The side chaining. Yeah. The side, there's basically a side chaining sound, but it's not side chaining. It's just, it's just super aggressive compression. Um, And he left it. He's like, that sounds great. And I've been, that's something that I've always like tried to figure out. It's like, how do I get this to sound good without the symbols to 
to like swell like that. But even he was like, oh yeah, a little bit. So I thought that was interesting. Well, a little bit of a tangent, but, uh, yeah. but anyway, things that he did also is like, he made like three duplicates of the snare. He had like uh and he like made different EQ points. So like he would filter out the low end or like only hyper saturate the top end. And one of them would be like hyper compressed, but he'd do like a uh, uh, 60 to like 120 millisecond attack time. So it'd be like only the, on, like he'd be using like as a tail. like as a transient designer basically just yeah. just using the transient um he he taught he talked about how using fab filter gate and the fab filter gate is the only gate with like a good look ahead that works really well it's like up yeah. to 10 milliseconds of look ahead um which is important for like a gate um with drums um he talked about like isolation so like he would gate things super heavy on the close mics and then the and he had like multiple room mics that he recorded with. So it was like there's like a near room mic and a far room mic or something like that. He had like a a crotch mic. And then on another video, this is, to add it all up, on another video, he played. Uh, he's like, I'm really into single mic drum recording these days. And he explained how he does like a little cheap ass dynamic microphone mm -hmm. <laughs> in mm -hmm. front of the mic. And he's like, the only secret to this is that you just have to hit the cymbals really softly. But all he does is he plays the drum with a single mic, mono, and then he puts it through his, what is it, the A37, J J37 tape machine, the real one. Oh, yeah. He has a real one. And he's like, it's done. It's a single mic. It sounds, <laughs> yeah. and he like played some records with it, and he's like, "Yeah," and I'm like, "Holy shit, that actually sounds amazing." <laughs> but anyway, that's unrelated. But in this case, he was using like sixteen to twenty different microphones. Um, no, I think no, it was probably closer to like twelve to fourteen, and then he was duplicating a lot. So the entire session ended up being like thirty tracks, like twenty to thirty tracks. Um, and yeah, the distressors, his distressors on the drum bus. Um, what was he using on like the kicks? Uh, oh yeah, like the compressor that he used didn't matter. He was using uh like some Native Instruments Smash type plugin that he got for Actually, free. Actually, that plugin is great. Yeah, and he's like, I don't like this yeah. plugin. Like, he's like, I go in, I go in and out of usage of plugins. So I do the same thing. Like, he's like, I like have like habits that I tend to keep, like plugins that I use for a time, and then I don't use those anymore or move on to something else. Um, he's like, yeah, I guess I was using these a lot on this session, but I don't use those anymore. But anyway, go get this plugin. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, so um, we were talking about that, and uh, or he was talking about the plugins, and it's just a lot of compression, a lot of duplicates, a lot of like um, chain through saturation compression, um, changing the tones of like various different duplicates, and using those as like EQ to blend in. Um, at the end, and the end sound, dude, it sounds so different, like uncomfortably different from the original. Um, and go watch that video. He also talks about like if you have a good drum recording, it'll sound bad. <laughs> like <laughs> what a raw drum drum recording sounds without any processing, it's supposed to sound like this. Like this is a good drum recording, and he explains it and he shows it to you, and he's like, yeah. And then he plays it afterwards, and it's like so good, and it's just like this is no way that this is not a sampled drum kit. It sounds like yeah. a sample drum kit, almost. Like, that's how good it sounds. And uh, he's like, yeah. This is, the, by the way, this is not, he's like, this is not diminishing the recording of the drums. Like, the drums were recorded fantastically. <laughs> you know, were, were recorded great. <laughs> anyway. No. Yeah, I, it's it's kind of funny because, like, it's kind of like how you said, nowadays you don't see a lot of people tracking live drums uh, that often. And it's not that it's kind of, like, falling out of style or anything. I feel like it's kind of on the come up right now again. Yeah, it's an accessibility um, thing. Like, you need the mics, exactly. you need the room, you need a good drummer. You need to not piss off your neighbors, You too. need to know so how to home engineer recording it, people, yeah. you know. Yeah. You need to know how to engineer, you need to know how to mix it. There's a lot more. There's actual skill that goes into drums, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Which is why it's always been kind of, like, seen for me as, like, my favorite thing to record, just because there's a lot going into it. And I just have a good time. Just It's, it's a weird thing to have a good time doing. Who likes doing small tedious little detailed things yeah there's i remember when i was recording a lot of drums that because it was you and i think the same way on this because it was difficult and hard to get right i would get so excited and i would put so much freaking effort into getting it right i remember yep. spending so much time 
play what part of the dr- room the drums should be in when I had the big control the live room like which part of the room I should put the drums in how to do the room mics even changing out the drum the the drums itself yeah dude it was it was like it got really nerdy and then mixing it like I mm-hmm. I I liked the challenge of it it's it sincerely is fun it sounds like you had the same experience oh yeah even now like uh like I mentioned, like with the the James Barr show that we recently did for K-Flay, um, since it was available, I decided to have them deliver me like individually track channel uh, channel outs from the console because uh, we were using the Yamaha CL3, which is like the step down to the console that I typically would use for concerts. Um, it's really just a lesser channel count. You know, there's the CL1, 3, and 5, and one's like, I think it's like eight channels and then the matrix and then the other one's 16 channels, the matrix, the other one's 24 channels, the matrix and the effects groups all in one physical body. But it's, it's all the same shit. You can, you can use the same snakes with it and make them work all the same for the most part. Um, Aside from some minor details, but one great thing is that you can multi-track out of it and it's a great sounding console. So uh, I've been mixing down the concert audio because uh, they had like, uh, actually, funny enough, our mutual friend Machi, he was hired to do the videography for it. Um, so there was like three cameras running and everything. And so like I'm mixing drums right now, not to sound studio, but to sound live with some studio taste. Is Did he ask you know? for the recording? Is this like something you're doing for fun or is this something you're doing for like high? Uh, I'm helping them with the actual content. I was hired to do front of house mixing and everything. And, so this uh, is just extra once stuff. I, yeah, once I heard Machi was the videographer, I'm like, you know what? This could be a fun one. Like, just to, just to mix it down for video and have that be released as content, like, I would want a concert that I engineered to sound great. Nice. You know, I would hate for the recording that they used to be, because uh, fun side note fact, you know, for anybody that wouldn't know this inherently, but... When you go to a concert, what you're hearing out of the speakers is the most obvious um, example of acoustics versus playback, which is the room might have like a two to three second decay and not at all frequencies equally, which means that room is not going to be flat by any means and the decay is going to blur some of the sound in the room. So sometimes you just have to fight it with more sound pressure, some more SPL in the room. And that's kind of a clusterfuck situation when you think about like what's actually coming out of the master out of a console. So if you're ever trying to get a a recording of a show that you're performing at or that an artist that you're working with is performing at and you want to record it, recording a, a duplicate of those master outs will not actually represent the mix you hear through those speakers because you're playing for the room and stage bleed and other factors are coming into why you're mixing it a certain way at a concert. You know, if you're in a small venue, then the drum set might naturally be loud in that room. So you might not actually mix the drums loud through the speakers. You might enhance the beater or the kick drum coming through it, but that would be a a poor recording to listen to in your headphones. You just, know? So, just the kick skin. Exactly. So <laughs> once I heard it was Machi uh, doing videography, I'm like, you know what? Let's multi-track it. Let's properly mix down the actual concert stems and let's do it. And to be honest, it's been a blast because um, I've been working with more bands lately, but I've always had an appreciation for like one shot recordings. You know, when artists just like, I like the way we play it live and that's the recording we want to have. It's like, cool. And in this case, it's literally the live performance of the studio songs. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that is true for, we are talking about drum recording and mixing in a studio context, not yeah. in a live context, not in a live context, which is a whole yeah. different thing. Whole um, different thing. Props to you. I hate mixing nah. live. You have <laughs> nerves of steel. Like in order to mix live, you have to be, you have to have I no neurotic not. tendencies. You, you want to hear one of the most nerve wracking things that happened in the middle of the show? I literally had to run from I the second floor. I almost don't, but for the audience, I will say yes. Okay. Uh, playback stopped working midway through a song. Everybody's on in-ears with click tracks and everything. On the first night, we had two sold out nights. Like it crashed? Like it did that, like, please, please restart Ableton. Like the USB disconnected from the computer. Oh, fuck. And then on the next song, the computer fell, but didn't disconnect. So, like, 
the the how USB rowdy sl- is this concert <laughs> oh dude it's a, it's a rock concert you know um but it was just funny because um uh i hear the click go out and i'm thinking like the band is going to keep going the band's got to keep going and they sure enough they finish out the song they they're still on point and everything they're a great band um but all the playback tracks the click tracks had disappeared and the first thing i hear through the mic after the song hey lou are you getting playback (laughs) and that was my key to run on stage and try to troubleshoot it for them uh, because the person running playback just doesn't typically do that yeah yeah dang dude That's wild. Yeah, the stress of that. The first time I ever had like a proper panic attack was at a wedding. Um, And the live show forgot all the cables. I think I've told. Oh my God, yeah. Like since then, I've been like susceptible to like anxiety attacks. Like that was like the first time I thought I was going to like die. Like I was like, I'm going to get a heart attack actually. It's. uh, Do you remember the day you had unfounded trust issues? (laughs) Yeah, dude, it was fucking then, dude. It was the the live sound man. Yeah, the um, yeah. there was like a substitute live sound guy at a wedding, and we were all the way up. We drove all the way up to f- nowhere, Jackson Hole, Wyoming, for this wedding. And the most they wanted to do like a countryside wedding, probably some rich Manhattan family that just wanted to do this <laughs> countryside wedding. Um. And uh, yeah, the sound guy forgot the bucket of cables. And this is so in the middle of nowhere that the only store available is literally Radio Shack. What is it? Radio Radio Shack. Radio Shack. And they had Mm -hmm. one XLR cable and we couldn't mic up anything. And it was, we had to borrow from other neighboring weddings and events. And it was, it was like, it was the most stressful thing I've ever had to deal with. And, uh, God damn, dude, it was wild. I could yeah, not. I do I not envy not those it. situations. But hey, now you know there's a one mic drum technique that you know might work out for this wedding. No, not with that drummer. <laughs> he hits that cymbals. The cymbals like crazy. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, anyway, we won't get into live mixing, but um, with uh drums, I do think that with uh, there's a tendency right now we're gonna see. This is, uh, now we're just speculating and I'm just kind of talking shit right now, but, um, I do think that if you have studios around you that have the capability of recording drums or you, or you mix for an artist that records drums at a nearby studio, go, go and learn. Like it, you don't have to intern, just be present for the session. Like, you know, maybe the engineer won't like it if you ask them tons of questions, but just watch what they're doing and ask them questions afterwards you know, um, but go and be part of doing more real drum sessions. And I think that'll be a major benefit to you because right now we're seeing a cultural swing of la- this last year. Uh, Hip hop has become significantly less popular, even in a single year. Um, and uh, I, th- I think it's less to do with hip hop and it's more of like quality of music and the inherent um, inherent. Uh, amount of work that is very obvious <laughs> or lack of work yeah. that is very obvious that is put into each of these songs. And um like regardless of whether or not you like Drake, her loss was probably the lowest effort album that I've ever heard, like ever. Can I just be happy to hear that somebody else thought that too? I got I gotta say like dude, it I, sounds I like 13 year olds like speed made all, every single beat. Like I know I'm not the biggest Drake fan. I know I've vocalized that before, but it's it's it was one of those that just kind of like wasn't helping the situation for me. Yeah, and there's only so many rappers that can record line per line, not writing anything beforehand that don't have bars. Uh, that mm-hmm. that's more of a vibe that can exist before people are like, "This is annoying," <laughs> you know, like. Yeah. Uh, and um, I love Twenty One Savage, but like, you know, after it's like it was good like the first time. And uh, <laughs> and as much as and we're seeing like the, this is not just a personal opinion. Um, I need to be careful. As much as I love hip hop and I like hip hop, we're seeing a cultural trend where right now, like you know what I'm mixing on. Like I'm mixing a bunch of like uh, hyper pop, like a bunch yeah. of like EDM dance, crazy distorted, like punk rock, but in the form of EDM. You know, mm-hmm. like super distorted minus three LUFS every single mix, like just wild <laughs> distortion. <laughs> Um, we're seeing country come back. Beyonce did a country album. Um, we're seeing everybody's like, going after that uh, death magnetic loofs. 
Yeah, and we're seeing uh, just in general, Corey we're seeing Wong, less low ended music. Yeah, we're seeing. With, I would say sub content, sub less sub content. And I have a feeling say. that hip hop will fuse with other. Like I think that the side of hip hop that is high effort and very creative will definitely stay alive. And I think that they will incorporate more musicians, especially as AI comes into comes into town and becomes a bigger and bigger deal. Um, we've already had splice and sampling, but is even with even with AI, like having real instruments, having real yeah. people, real groove is going to be like real effort into these songs is going to be more and more important. So um, I, all in this to say, learn how to record drums, learn how to mix drums. And I think that, uh, I think it'll be only of benefit to you. And then it'll help you even mix sample drums better too. Oh yeah. And be able to pick out what drums sound good for what reason and, and pick up different techniques. Like there's even things like if you have a two track drum kit like that you got from Splice and you some you want to just mix um the kick, you want to add more kick. Like these are that you could take the same techniques that we were talking about earlier, duplicate that, filter it out so it's just the low end and somehow saturate it, use some like transient designer and you can like synthetically add some punch to the kick drum, you know? I mean, yeah. there's only so much that you can do, but learning how to problem solve like this with limited, with limited uh, resources and is, is limited, valid beyond, it's, it's useful beyond yeah. drums, just mixing drums. Yeah, sometimes it's also a limitation of which techniques will work in what situation. For instance, like a well-recorded snare doesn't always mean that you're not going to have bleed from the other drums. So noise gating might be like something that you haven't really dealt with that much in the past. But um, hyper compression may actually be like the part where it's like, oh, my God, now that bleed's getting louder and you might not know or feel confident in if that's the right choice or not anymore. So sometimes people when you're when you're trying it out for the first time, it may feel weird trying these things. But you'd be surprised how many times like people are bringing out the noise in the background of these live mics. Yeah, you know the the Gooch mic being a, a fun mic, you know, the, it's Gooch or the, the crotch, crotch mic, the crotch yeah. mic. It's literally a mic that's right between, like, I guess you could say the kick, the snare, the floor tom, and it's pointed right at your crotch. Um, but that one, once you hyper compress it and everything, it's like suddenly that drum kit doesn't sound like isolated tracks. And you you could just add a little bit of it. And I've seen where some people add a ton of it and it can make a world of a difference in the character of the drums. A single mic, a single reference that's not one specific part of the drum set it's just this generalized position in the drum set can make the world of a difference in your recording or mix. Yeah. It's interesting. I'm I'm now just realizing like how much of a difference like the skill of engineering is slowly having a resurgence. I mean, think about yeah. it. Even the idea of like recording a guitar amp. You mm-hmm. have single mic, multiple mic, blending of mics. Are you you gonna have put open the how- cab style, closed cab style. Are you gonna, yeah, the different types of speakers that you use. Mm-hmm. Um, are you gonna put the mics near the outside of the speaker versus the center of the speaker, and how that changes the tone, the slight distance back and forth? What is the actual relevance of that guitar line that is being recorded? Is it a rhythm guitar? Is it a lead guitar? Or is it kind of like, uh, like a, uh, what? Let's say you're double stacking left and double stacking right. Is it the primary tone source or is it the rhythm tone source? So it's like these are all these are all things that you need to think about. So there's like an actual skill um, to recording. This is just a fucking amp. You know, now we're talking about like 12 to 18 mics on a single drum kit, you know, and now we're talking about the same thing. The t- snare top, m- which mic? Do you want to use a small diaphragm? Do you want to use a condenser do you want to use a dynamic do you want to, what do you want to use angle distance you know the the snare itself <laughs> the head the material of the snare wooden versus you know metal you know and, yep. and then on top of that you have do you like hi hat mics which hi hats you know and which mic are you going to use a dynamic mic are you not going to use a hi hat mic at all are you going to put it on the edge under over yeah, how many are you going to use uh, 47 on the outside of the kick? Or are you just going to do like another like sub kick type thing? How are you going to put the beta 52 inside? Or are you going to go with the AKG D12 because it's, you know, it's got a little bit more thump to it or whatever? I don't know. Um, it's, there's so much thought that goes into recording drums that um, 
if you want to get better as an engineer, this is like one of the few, I hate to say, this is so weird. It's easier to be involved in recording a drum kit and mixing a drum kit than it is to record an entire orchestra, which I think is also very useful. Like yeah. in recording an entire jazz band in the same room all at the same time, which starts with recording the drums, right? In the mm -hmm. co Now you have to think about like how um, we don't talk about like polar patterns anymore, like cardioid, hypercardioid, mm -hmm. figure eight, and how you have to use polar patterns in order to minimize bleed because you're all in the fucking yep. same room. And these, there was like an actual skill to recording. Now people are just like learning how to record vocals. And that's cool and all, but I, I hope and I think that we're going to see a resurgence in the next decade of like a return to actual skill in engineering. And and I will say, um, if you, in being in LA, working at smaller studios, you don't get these opportunities. I, you, Ro, Lou, you're a rock guy, hence why you have this, some of this opportunity. I had a full big ass studio in Utah and Utah didn't have a hip hop scene. So I had no other choice than to get involved in this, right? Yeah. If I want to make any money. And um, now and I, in LA, most studios that start or open, the first and only thing they're investing in is a vocal chain. That's they can it. Get the rest of it later. They don't even have. They don't even have more than two input channels. You know, yeah. and uh, so it's it's. This is just something that I want to recommend. Like we're also as much as we're a fan of making information accessible and making it easier for people to reach these levels. Um, that's a big part of it. The one thing that I truly believe in is that I will not lower the standard. I do not believe in lowering the standard. We are not mm -hmm. making things accessible by lowering the standard. We're making things yep. accessible by lifting you up and uh, lifting listeners up, right? So I hope and I think that we'll see a resurgence in the actual skill of engineering. And I think drums is the easiest way to get into it, is one of the most fun ways of getting into it. And... Um, and I'm, there's still people that are alive that are working that if you can find a mentor that can help you with just this one thing, like if you can record the concept of just recording drums and experiment with that, um, that'll go into recording orchestras, recording, you know, entire yeah. Cha yeah, chamber orchestras, small or large orchestras in a hall. You know, and I'll say this, I like, uh, you don't have to niche into something, but let's say you learn a new specialty. Uh, you become skilled enough to actually get some active work in certain niche fields. You know, symphony recordings, like orchestra recordings, are some of the highest paying recording gigs you could ever ask for because you're not responsible for like three or four musicians in a room. We're talking like 20, 30 people in a room. Yeah, and they have you know? like, their union is like, I, th I forgot what it is now, but when I was in school, it was like 50 to $60 per hour, two hour minimum. Plus, like per you have person. per person, so and you have like twenty to fifty people, right? So yeah. we're talking about like every hour costs potentially, and the studio, and you're paying for the studio, which needs to be big to accommodate this, which has probably yeah. a big console to accommodate it, um, and you need to have an engineer that actually knows what they're doing. So you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars per hour. So you fuck up once because of something yeah. that happened. That was a multi thousand dollar mistake potentially. You know, yeah, and if it I, takes so long that it takes an hour to troubleshoot and fix, or you're on, you go home and you're like, I'm actually not able to use these recordings. Hour. Oh my goodness, yeah. So it's a high skilled, high pressure thing, um, and that goes into like the com usually at that level, the composers have actual like, um, at, like I've written the score on some paper, so you you have the score in front of you. You're able to actually read music enough to follow along as an engineer. You have cue points, you know. So it's like. It's there's a lot more organization that goes into it, which is great to be part of. Um, that's a whole thing that we could talk about, but that's this is so niche and so less normal that there'd be less listeners on the podcast. Like, there's few listeners on the podcast that would actually like this and benefit from this because this is such a well, niche, you never know. It's, it's high it's, level, it's also scale. not something we talk too much about. But it's, yeah, it is like we get we it's get, a fascination for those who are fascinated by audio in general. Yeah, the, the, I think the biggest downfall with doing any sort of content creation is sharing information like this. And this is very obvious, but I'm going to say it out loud is we are motivated by the number of ears are on our podcast. Like the more listeners we have, the more we're going to do that thing. So like uh, vocal recordings and vocal chains are always the highest listened to episodes of the podcast. I fucking hate it. We talked <laughs> about it at least 15, half a dozen times, right? Yeah. And... um it's it's uh, 
it's like it's cool, but it's like the most. There's so many other places you can look it up. It's such like a low entry, like a low skill thing. Um, yeah, there's only thing so that, much that we could talk about it. Like, I don't know. It's so unique to each individual singer. Um, and I don't know. There's only so much that we can talk about it. Like, there's only so many yeah. mic placements you can do with a vocal. Anyway, there's only so many places that I've actually like listened in to where they're like, okay, today we're going to talk about like drum tuning and the relevance of drum tuning per record. You know, yeah. are you tuning to key? Are you not tuning to key? Why? And and you on know, top of that, like, how many people are actually going to click on that? You know, listen exactly. to that. Exactly. So like we because because those are the ones that get the most views, we're naturally going to le- uh, go gravitate towards these vocal mixing type episodes, which sucks for us. And uh, I mean, it's great for y'all, but it sucks for us because that's just so it's limiting what we do. So it's kind of like this gen- making content is this gentle balance of like talking about what we think is actually important for the world, what we're personally interested in versus what brings us numbers. And um, luckily with the podcast, we I say whatever the hell I want. And because podcasts are notorious for, you know, the the plat- the the platform of podcasting is like pretty do whatever the fuck you want. And it's. And, uh, which is great. Say whatever, save whatever the heck you want. And, um, and I do, we're, but we're we need to, to it's our... also difficult to like talk yeah. about like changing out drum skins or, or drum heads and, and how that it's difficult to talk about that in a podcast form. Yeah. And we're trying to find our middle ground between Rick Rubin and, uh, Collier. Uh, Jacob Collier. We're, That's Jacob funny. Collier. You want to talk yeah, about this meme? Yeah, yeah I loved it. It's not even a meme because it was it was like when you look at the reel, like at no oh, point no, did no, they yeah. intended to be funny. Yeah, but it's just funny, just in the context of like if you if you listen to both, then you're you're kind of like, oh, okay. Well, Rick Rubin um, has various books, um, but in one of them, you know, he mentions uh, no, no, no. How, he has the one. I think he only has one. That one. I thought he had the two creative books. acts one. I me, I'm looking. Two. I'm looking it up. Yeah. Um. But yeah, um, in the book, he mentions, you know, you have to picture yourself on this like mountain and you're alone. You have this luxury home, whatever, you know, music should be made uh, selfishly, not for the audience. When you make it for the audience, it's in unoriginal, it's unorganic. You know, you want it to be something that's all about you and only for you. And those that will like it will flock to it. You know, those that resonate with it will resonate with it. And Jacob Collier is like, yeah, but you also want to make it for your audience. You know, that's what I do. And the thing that cracked me and DK up is like, if you ever listen to Jake, uh, Jacob Collier, um, I don't know how many people in the audience He's said, yeah, this is exactly what audience. I was looking for. This is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> yeah, yep, that's sing, what I wanted to hear sing, today. <laughs> repeat, uh, repeat a single fucking melody. <laughs> like I'll say it like this: like I the think, one dude I that think, doesn't care about his audience actually makes pop hits that is generally accepted. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the other one makes the most niche music that's for no one. <laughs> yeah, but it's like those that can understand it appreciate it because it's like oh, listen to him go. Like oh, this is so creative. But um. I, so I think any, your average he, listener is just not there. <laughs> and he was talking about like, oh yeah, it's so selfish to say that. And it's like, dude, your music is selfish, Jacob Collier. Like, who's that? <laughs> You're just flexing how genius you are. Like, this is not catchy. It's not like uh, I don't know. What was the other real? Uh, That's funny because how, like what it sounds like when Jacob Collier falls and he's like, oh. By the way, uh, yeah, oh my gosh, <laughs> uh, it's fun to make fun of him, but um, he is actually a genius and he really knows what he's talking yeah. about and. Um, it's funny, we there was a whole this is a whole nother concept, like the idea of like Jacob wasn't born that way. You know, like I mean, he may have had the the abilities, the genetics mm-hmm. to learn perfect pitch, but he had to learn it. And he had to sit down and study theory. Like, you know, like he doesn't just innately understand theory more than anybody else. No, he fucking learned harder and studied harder than everybody else. And that's why that's and he developed his skill early on. Like that's that's something that we need to talk about too. It's like talent. Fuck talent. Jake Jacob Collier isn't just. He's only seems talented because nobody else is willing and was willing to put in the work like he did, and he was yeah. willing to put in the work because he loved it, you know. Um, and we've done episodes about like finding the thing that you're passionate about that you're you don't even realize that you're putting work into. At the end of the day, that's what music is for us. Like, we don't mind working long hours. Um, sorry, this is a tangent, but this has made me think about this. Like a. On uh, Instagram, there's a reel that came up uh, of, and I'm just going to describe it first, and I'm going to tell you what I think about and and then what the general comments said 
what I thought about. Um, it was very old women, men and women in Japan making food. And it was like serving food at a restaurant. So like they were running a restaurant. Like the woman was hunchback, bent over. Like you can tell that she like bends over. The man was as well. Like there's a couple of them. And they were just making food at like 80 to 90 years old. Um, and I thought, and this is the Japanese context. This is ikigai at its finest. This is, they love this shit. How beautiful. And I started tearing up watching this video. Like, oh my goodness, how beautiful it is that they could be this old and still love what they do. And then I open up the comments. And in the American perspective, it's, it's a lot of how sad that they couldn't save up money, that they have to work in order to survive, even at this age. How yeah. sad it is. Um, and in the Japanese context, that doesn't make sense. Um, you know, it's, it's very strange. Working is... Um, I think that we, we won't go into the nuance of the lack of religion in Japan. Um, but uh, we in Japan, we have something called Ikigai, which is not as deep as some of these books and some of these like influencers say it is. Ikigai is just this idea of like, it's something that you want to live for. When you, when you have no religion and you don't believe in a God, uh, in, an omnipotent, in an omnipotent being, why do you live? And in the Japanese perspective, it's more like there's no real reason to die. So even the idea of like, liking food i like to eat fried rice that's enough of a reason to not kill yourself you know um i don't mean to be existential about this but this is like east versus west complex and the re part of the reason why i won't get into why i don't think western religion will make it into the east and do well other outside of korea which is very rare um uh the uh the idea of uh yeah anyway so ikigai we have like various reasons to want to stay alive and for them it's obviously cooking and and with jobs it's very honorable to do whatever you want like if you want to cook and have a hole in the wall mom pa shop go for it and it's probably going to be better food than anywhere else and you just chase what you want and you do what you want and you the idea of retirement is 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 important but it's also kind of silly because you only get to retire if you do something you hate for 60 years you know for 40 years yeah so it's like instead just it's it's honorable it's distinguished. It is not looked down upon to be poor and to do what you want, as long as you can make a living for you and your family, which the expectation to do so is significantly lower in Japan as well. So um, I just thought it was, I thought that was super interesting with, with uh, I want to end it like that, like with music, like all this stuff, it's difficult, but it's fun. And it, if it's not fun, this may not be the thing for you. Um, and it's important that everybody find their ikigai. Um, what do you live for? What do you want to do? And, uh, on that note, uh, get better at mixing drums. Record some drums. Lou, any final thoughts on drums? Yeah, touch some grass. Go outside. Listen to some acoustic drums. Acoustic <laughs> drums. Go, go outside. No, no, but, it, yeah, no, but realistically yeah, speaking, like I think one of the coolest things is um, there's so many resources for drums. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Drumio. And I know Drumio is mainly oh, for yeah. drummers. You know, It's mainly a resource for drummers wanting to learn to perform and play and it's entertainment based around drummers but i actually find their content like really entertaining like chad smith listens to the kill by 30 seconds to mars for the first time and improvises it and when you look when you watch it and you see like passionate musicians it makes you like kind of want to capture that passion you know and um uh i recently saw that one of the bands i've been listening to um sleep token their drummer who uh, you're. I know you're familiar with Slipknot, DK, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of they're the people that wear the masks and all that. Yeah, yeah. Well, everybody knows who their identities are, but Sleep Token, they do all their identities completely anonymous, similar to that clown uh, metal uh, clown core band, clown core. Um, so everybody's completely anonymous, but Drumio still gave the drummer for the band. He goes by two, as in the number two, um, uh, drummer of the year at the Drumio Awards, and um. It, it was kind of interesting because it's one of those where I'm like, I'm really glad because I really do think he's like a great drummer. And those kind of like when you hear those performers, like you kind of be want to be there. You kind of want to like, man, listen to the to the level of expertise behind this. And then when you get those tracks live, like you don't want to mess up that mix. Yeah. Listen to the amount of skill it takes to be able to perform on that level. We're not talking AI. We're not talking drum programming. We're talking like 
this guy fucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know Imagine but, it's just Bruno Mars. Uh, oh my God, Bruno uh, Mars behind a mask. Dude, you know what? I would instantly become a Bruno Mars fan for the first time. Well, I mean, he is a drummer. No, you know he about, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if that was him the whole time, I'd have been like, sold, done. I, You fooled me. You got me. You yeah. got me. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thanks so much for listening to the Mason Music Podcast. If you like this sort of stuff and you want more technical, shorter, short technical episodes, go to mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive. We've had a few new people sign up. These exclusive episodes are ad-free and uh, they're awesome. And you don't just get two new exclusive episodes every single week, but you get access to the entire catalog. And I think there's a couple hundred now at this point. So you can binge watch all of them. Um, it's $4 a month or $40 a year, exclusive mixingmusicpodcast.com slash exclusive. Lastly, if you like the show and you want to support us in a way that costs you zero dollars and zero cents, just rate the episode and the yeah. the show five stars on whatever platform that you're listening on. And if you're listening on Google Podcasts, which is going away, and whether you join Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or some other form of uh, podcast listening, Again, just feel free to leave a five-star review, though that does boost us in the algorithm, and it's it's free, dude. It's free. So we are very grateful for anybody that has done that. We see your comments. Um, ev- yeah, so thank you so much. On that note, happy mixing, my friends, and stay saucy. Stay saucy.